George, you run that horse too fast. She likes it, Henry, and I like her. She's a fine horse. Nothing I like better than a fine horse. Yes, like most boys, there was nothing that young man named George Washington liked better than a fine horse. And what fun it was to gallop around the large Virginia plantation on the Potomac River where he lived with his family. This was, of course, many, many years ago in the 18th century, oh, around the 1740s, in fact, when Virginia was still a colony and when the United States was not yet called the United States, but was simply 13 colonies belonging to the King of England. But young George Washington didn't spend all his time on his horse. There was schoolwork to be done, and by the time he was 11 years old, George had learned to read and to write and to do arithmetic. And to improve his handwriting, he copied down some rules of proper behavior in company and conversation. That is, the do's and don'ts, uh, having to do with the manners that a young gentleman in the 18th century was supposed to have. Rules such as... It is better to be alone than in bad company. If you cough, sneeze, sigh, or yawn, do it not loud, but privately. Drink not, nor talk not with your mouth full. Think before you speak. Undertake not what you cannot perform, but be careful to keep your promise. Speak not evil of the absent, for it is unjust. George tried to live by these rules, and so he grew up to be a young gentleman. And his knowledge grew with his manners as he came to know more and more about such things as mathematics and navigation and surveying. That's the art of measuring land, you know. When he was only 14 years old, a wealthy neighbor by the name of Lord Fairfax said to him, George, I'd like you to work for me surveying my lands. The work is hard and may be dangerous, but I'll pay you well. Thank you, sir. I'd like that. And I don't mind danger, sir. In the next three years, George met many dangers as he traveled far and wide on his surveying job. He knew what it meant to be cold and to go hungry, to pass through fire and flood and uncharted forests. He learned also the dangers of dealing with Indians and other people who were not always friendly. Living an outdoor life, George grew tall and strong by the time he was 20 years old. His brother Lawrence, who had been a soldier and who was George's idol, taught him some military skills. And his brother had arranged with the governor of Virginia, Governor Dinwiddie, to make George a major in the Virginia militia. It wasn't long before Governor Dinwiddie sent George on a perilous mission across the Allegheny Mountains to deliver a message to the French commander at Fort Le Boeuf, protesting the building of a chain of French forts between Lake Ontario and the falls of the Ohio River. Well, it was a rough trip, all right, but George got through to the fort safely and delivered the message. But on his way home, he almost lost his life twice. The first time was when an Indian guide suddenly turned and shot at him. And the second time was when he fell into the ice-cold water of the Allegheny River while crossing it on a raft. But when he returned home at last, Governor Dinwiddie made him a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia because he had carried out his assignment so bravely. Soon, George's days of real soldiering began when the French and Indian War started up. That was when the English king wanted the French king to give up his territory in America. And the English king sent one of his great generals, General Braddock, with a large army of red-coated British soldiers to fight the French and their Indian allies. General Braddock had heard of the brave young Washington and invited him to serve as an officer on his staff. George accepted, 
He rode with General Braddock at the head of the fine British army when they went to capture the important French defense post, Fort Duquesne, at the junction of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers. The splendid British soldiers in their bright red uniforms had just entered the dark forest that lay in front of the fort. They marched magnificently as if on parade. It was not a very wise thing to do in the wilderness, but they felt confident and they strutted on. But then, suddenly, bullets flew from everywhere. But the enemy was not in sight. They were too well covered by the trees and the brush. The British troops were caught in a crossfire. They didn't know where to shoot or what to shoot at. They ran in all directions in panic. Bravely, the officers tried to rally the men. Washington galloped forward and back trying to urge the men on. Then a bullet hit his horse, and it went down under him. As it fell, George leaped from the saddle. A riderless horse came by. In a moment, he was up on it. Onward, men! Straighten your lines! Take to the brush! One bullet ripped through Washington's hat. Another threw his sleeve. And again, another horse was shot from under him. He mounted a third horse. This horse was killed under him, too. He caught a fourth. Fight on, men! Hurry on! Fight! Fight! Washington's courageous efforts, the battle was lost. General Braddock and many of his men were killed. Washington led the remaining troops out of battle. Again, recognizing his courage, Governor Dinwiddie promoted Washington on his return and made him commander of all the soldiers in Virginia. And George was only 23 years old by now. Two years later, the French were finally forced to give up Fort Duquesne. The French and Indian War was over. Now Washington returned to his home at Mount Vernon and married a pretty young widow with two children. Her name was Martha Custis. He planned to settle down to the good, quiet life of a wealthy farmer. He was made a member of the House of Burgesses, which was the group of men who met in Williamsburg to make the laws for Virginia. One day, Washington returned from one of the meetings in Williamsburg. He seemed disturbed at dinner that night. And after the meal was over, his wife, Martha, said, George, dear, you seem upset. What's the matter? Martha, I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? These new taxes that King George is putting on us. Taxes on everything, it seems. On paper, glass, paint. Now the stamp tax. We have to buy stamps for newspapers, marriage licenses, and every paper used in business. I tell you, King George is not wise. He doesn't understand that we colonists are free men and have rights. I tell you, the colonists won't stand for it much longer. And the colonists didn't stand for it. There were even riots, and in many places, men took the tax stamps and made big piles of them and set fire to them in the public square of many towns. Finally, the Stamp Act was repealed, but other tax laws took its place. Can you imagine now they've gone and put a tax on tea? You can't even have a pleasant cup of tea now without having the king's tax stick in your throat. Now, I don't think that's fair. He shouldn't tax us unless we be represented so we can have a say in it. I say, no taxation without representation, that's what I say. Some people in Boston got so hop and mad about this new tax that, well, one day a British ship loaded with tea sailed into Boston Harbor and anchored there. That night, some Boston citizens got together and said, Let's stop the tea! And they dressed up like Indians and made their way silently down to the ship lying quietly in the harbor. Quickly, they ran on board, found all the tea, and dumped every last freight overboard, and quickly ran away. The word of this action spread rapidly around the country and made every American jump with glee at what they called the Boston Tea Party. But it didn't make King George of England jump with glee. He was angry and sent an army to Boston to do away with the free government of Massachusetts and to make everyone obey the English general. 
The colonists really got angry then and decided to get together to meet this threat to their liberty. And so, in 1774, they sent delegates to a meeting in Philadelphia to see how to handle the situation. And George Washington went along with the other well-known colonists to this gathering, which was known as the First Continental Congress. Not too long after he was back home from this meeting, a horseman galloped up the drive at Mount Vernon. He dismounted quickly and ran toward Washington, who happened to be standing by the carriage. Colonel Washington, sir! They're fighting in Concord, sir! What's happened? The British! The British tried to seize arms and gunpowder. The townspeople and the farmers defended themselves and fought them. They're digging in on Bunker Hill in Boston now. But that's revolution. Right, sir. You might call it that. Revolution, sir! The fire of it soon spread to Virginia, where the British army posted there attempted to capture the arms of the Virginians in Williamsburg. The militiamen stood their ground. A second Continental Congress was summoned together in Philadelphia the following spring to see what further measures should be taken against the British. When Washington appeared there in his militia uniform, members knew he was ready to fight. Somebody proposed... Gentlemen, I nominate Colonel George Washington of Virginia to command our new Continental Army. <laughs> So Washington took command of the army in July 1775. It wasn't much of an army, but the men in it sure had spirit. All men are created equal, but they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While Washington trained the army, Congress issued the Declaration of Independence, which stated that people had now created a nation of their own with the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A new nation. Now the question is, can we defend it? An army of untrained citizens against the finest soldiers in the world. Could it be done? Quite a question. Especially now that warships brought additional soldiers from England, which landed in New York and quickly chased the Americans from the island of Manhattan. Retreat followed retreat in that bitter year of 1776. It was bad. Washington's army was a ragged, poorly equipped band of men, without money, food, or clothing to speak of, and what's worse in a war, few guns and little gunpowder. Things looked hopeless for the colonists. But Washington had patience and courage. He had devotion and hope. And so he persisted in his efforts to resist the enemy. Now at this time, Christmas, 1776, stationed in Trenton, New Jersey, were some troops of Hessian soldiers. These were Germans whom the English paid to fight for them. Washington thought of a clever plan. On Christmas, he directed a surprise attack by crossing the Delaware River silently in the night. Rapidly, he overwhelmed the amazed Hessian troops. News of this victory spread quickly through the colonies and encouraged patriots everywhere in the country. And Washington was praised as a great commander-in-chief. But in the next two years, the brave general faced the most dangerous and difficult days of his life. When winter came upon the land, Washington marched his ragged army over icy roads to a tiny village called Valley Forge, just 20 miles away from Philadelphia, where the English enemy was now stationed. As the freezing days dragged on, conditions for Washington and his men became worse and worse. Many of his soldiers deserted, the wounded lay dying without medicine or proper care, and the entire army was starving and suffering from the cold. Now even the great General Washington was becoming despondent. The situation appeared so hopeless. It seemed as though only a miracle could help. And then, not one, but two miracles took place. One of the miracles drove into Washington's camp at Valley Forge on coach wheels one bitter day in February. 
It was the miracle of love. When the coach rumbled into the camp, Washington rushed out of his tent, and to his amazement, out from the coach stepped... Martha! You've come all the way from Mount Vernon. Oh, my dear, my dear. George, George, your letters drove me here. I could read your concern and your weariness between the lines. And now, oh, dear, I see it in your eyes. No, no, my dear. Now that my eyes see you, all worry and weariness vanish. Come into the tent. Yes. You must be frozen. What have you there with you? Well, I have medicine and food, and I have knitting needles. Oh. Not much, but I'm going to do what I can for your poor soldiers. I'm going to try to knit stockings for every last one of them. I may not be able to do it, but I'll try. <laughs> But first of all, my dear, I'm going to take care of you. Come, my dear General. Let me fix you a cup of hot broth to warm your heart. Martha, I don't need hot broth to warm my heart. Your coming here has done that. It has given me new life. It will give our cause new life. Martha Washington's coming to Valley Forge indeed gave the General and his men a tremendous lift in spirit. Finally, spring came, and with it, the second miracle. One day, a messenger came galloping into Valley Forge, shouting, General Washington, the French have joined us. The French have joined us right now, sir. Money, ships, and soldiers are on the way across the ocean to help us. The second miracle had come, the miracle of friendship. A young Frenchman by the name of the Marquis de Lafayette, who had helped the colonists to get this aid, said to Washington, Mon General, we shall fight together, your country and mine, for la liberté. And finally, in October 1781, at Yorktown in Virginia, the Americans and their French allies caught the British soldiers and their General Cornwallis in a trap and forced them to give up. In a field outside of Yorktown, with the Americans on one side and the French on the other, the British troops marched in surrender and threw their weapons into a large pile. Washington sat like a statue on his fine white horse while the surrender took place. And so, after six difficult years of war, the American Revolution came to an end. The Americans had won their freedom. King George III had to admit that the 13 colonies had indeed become the free United States of America. And who was the hero? George Washington. An American patriot said of him, First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Long live George Washington! <laughs> Yes, the people cheered him and called him father of his country and elected him their first president. Like all fathers, he had his worries for a young country can be like a young child, a little difficult at times. But George Washington, you remember, had patience and courage. He had devotion and hope. All the things a father needs. And with such qualities in a leader, a little country can go a long way, especially if it always keeps in mind these words that George Washington spoke when he said farewell to his country after he finished his second term as president. Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all.